Hi class, today we're going to be looking at the review for chapter 12, um, which is going to be on human genetics, looking at how that relates to what we've done in class, but then also how it will relate to the tests that you'll be having. So first we're going to look at human patterns of inheritance. Uh, so the first question here, what are the sex chromosomes for humans? And what sex chromosomes are carried by egg and sperm cells? So, oh, sorry about that. So the sex chromosomes for humans are XX for female and XY for male. So the egg can only carry an X chromosome and the sperm can carry either an X or a Y chromosome. So we talked about this in class that if um, a couple is having a child, the child's sex is actually determined by the sperm, whether it has the X in it or the Y. Number two here, explain linked genes and provide an example. So linked genes are when genes are really close together on the same chromosome or on the same chromosome and they will appear to be linked, which goes against Mendel's law of independent assortment. But linked genes can get separated from each other through crossing over. That's kind of the way that it would get separated from another gene on the same chromosome. If they are really close together on the same gene, are on the same chromosome, sorry, if the two genes are really close together on the same chromosome, then their chance of being separated is very unlikely compared to if they are far apart on the same chromosome, they have a greater chance of being separated through crossing over. An example could be um, like sex-linked genes. Those genes are linked to the X chromosome, and so they're stuck to that X chromosome or attached to that X chromosome. Um, another example would be just having um, a chromosome. If we have gene A at the top of the chromosome and gene B and C at the bottom of the chromosome, B and C are likely to stay together or be linked, and A will often get separated through crossing over. Number three here, be able to do sex-linked Punnett squares. So with sex-linked Punnett squares, we want to make sure that we can, um, let's see if I can get the pen to work here a little bit. We want to make sure that we show the trait. So let's say it's colorblindness, and it's linked to the X chromosome. So say we have a heterozygous female for colorblindness, and then we have a male who is colorblind. So they'd have a little c and then the y. Being able to do the Punnett square for this, and also be able to tell what our chances of having an offspring with a certain trait. So this would be our Punnett square, x big C, x little c, and then on this side here, x little c and y. So in these boxes, we're going to do just like we've done all the other Punnett squares. We're going to pull the information in. In this case, we have a heterozygous female. In this one, we have a colorblind female. Made these boxes a little too small here. So, colorblind female. Here we have normal vision male. And here we have colorblind male. So being able to tell then the genotypes or phenotypes of the sex-linked cross. Remember, don't start doing all Punnett squares as sex-linked, only the ones that tell you that they are sex-linked. So in this case, one thing we talked about as well is that if a girl has a sex-linked trait, they got the trait from mom and they got the trait from dad. If we have a colorblind boy or a sex-linked trait boy, um, then they got the trait from mom. They actually got the Y chromosome from dad. So if moms pass the trait to their boys, moms and dads pass their trait to the girls when it's sex linked. So question four here, why do linkage groups go against Mendel's law of independent assortment? And this relates to um, the fact that the law of independent assortment says that genes are separated from each other independently of each other and they are not linked. However, we have found through research and through following um, inheritance patterns that genes that are on the same chromosome often appear to be linked unless they can get separated through crossing over. 
Okay, number, um, or section two of the notes we did for this chapter, why are pedigrees used in genetic counseling? And pedigrees will be used in order to trace a familial um, trait, whatever that trait would be. It can be something that's a disease or it can just be a trait that you want to follow through. So maybe it's just blood type and you want to follow the blood type, um, different blood types through three or four generations. You could use a pedigree. So make sure that you can read, interpret, and draw a pedigree. Um, you're really going to have to be able to interpret one on the test, at least one. So make sure you look back over those. We've done a, quite a few in class, and you can go back through and check those out. If also you're struggling with them, if you go to the previous videos I've made, there's one with pedigrees, and then also on my website I've linked up um, some of the good websites to go to that will provide help for you and little tutorials. Okay, and then our last slide here, um, the last four questions, be able to explain the following mutation types. So we've just recently done this in class. Um, germ cell mutations are um, mutations that occur in the egg and the sperm or the gametes, and these are going to affect the offspring. They don't affect the individual, but they do affect the offspring. Somatic cell mutations are mutations in your body cells. These are going to affect you, but they will not affect your offspring. Lethal mutations are mutations that cause death, and often death occurs uh, before the, the individual is born. So these would cause, a lot of times, would cause miscarriage. Okay, number two, be able to explain the following chromosome mutations. So deletion is when we're missing a portion of the DNA or a nucleotide. Inversion, think about what inversion means to you. It's like flipping it upside down or having it in a different direction. So inversion, some of the letters or some of the nucleotide sequences get flipped. Translocation, a portion of the nucleotides gets relocated in the wrong spot. So maybe during crossing over, we have a portion of the leg of a chromosome that gets relocated in the wrong location. And then non-disjunction is when we end up with an extra chromosome in the child or we end up with one less chromosome than we're supposed to have. So there were two types of this. Trisomy is when we have an extra chromosome. So that would be 47 chromosomes instead of 46. And monosomy is when we have one less chromosome. So that would be 45 chromosomes instead of 46. Okay, and number three, the following gene mutations, point mutation and frame shift mutation. So a point mutation is a single nucleotide that gets changed. And a frame shift mutation is basically a misreading of the codons during translation because it shifts down a letter. So if it's supposed to start at AUG and then it's reading correctly and then we end up with a sequence that it skips one, maybe the um, ribosome skips a letter or something and so now it's shifted down a set of letters and that can cause a mutation in the protein that's being made. Okay, and then the last question, the process of genetic screening and counseling that is available. So genetic screening can occur before um, anybody has a child, and that could be just a genetic screen of the individual or the couple that wants to have a child to see if they, their chances of passing on a certain trait or disease. You could have screening during pregnancy, and so some of those things can be blood tests. Um, you could have an evaluation of um, through amniocentesis or chorionic villi sampling, which takes samples um, from the uterus, um, from inside the uterus, and then tests those. And then after birth, you can do a genetic screening of the child. This completes um, the information we had from Chapter 12 to prepare you for the test. Make sure that you are able to do the Punnett squares that are a little unique, like sex-linked traits, um, from Chapter 12.